should be coming up there. Good morning. We are going to begin our service this morning with number 205 in our blue hymn book, He Keeps Me Singing, number 205. So if you'll turn there or uh, look it up in a book that you have, He Keeps Me Singing. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5. 1, 3, and 5. today, give him the words to say, wisdom that he needs, and Father, that we have ears to hear. Pray that we would have tender hearts, that we would be open and receptive to your word today, and that we would have a desire to be changed, and that we would have a desire to make decisions today. We just pray that you would uh, bless all that takes place here today, pray that you would... Uh, uh, just uh, take and use this time to to draw us closer to you as we are uh, forced to slow down in life. And we just pray, Father, that you would be with our uh, the political leaders, uh, those in, uh, in leadership, that you would give them wisdom and that you would help them to do better than they know. Pray that you would uh, guide and direct, that you protect each one of us, and Father, may we uh, have a real testimony at this time and uh, that we would show that we are completely trusting in you 
to watch over us, to meet our needs, to care for us each day. We just pray now that as we continue on this morning, pray that all that takes place would bring honor and glory to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. As we go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And we're going to start reading down in verse 19. John chapter 20, starting at verse 19, and we'll read down through, we'll read through the end of the chapter. John chapter 20, verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said, when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days... Again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Amen. All right, well, thank you, Pastor Pooley, for being a part of our service this morning. We are going to take our hymn books once again, and let us turn to number 229, Since I Have Been Redeemed. Do you remember, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, do you remember when you were redeemed? Maybe it was just a few years ago, maybe it was many years ago. One thing we can say for sure is that our life has been changed. Let us sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Since I have been redeemed, since I 
Go. I just wanted to mention that, uh, as many of you probably know already, there have been some restrictions lifted, mostly just for outdoor activity, but it is a sign that uh, hopefully uh, we're able to start moving towards getting back to somewhat normal. And so just uh, keep an eye on the news there to see as the things change. And so uh, it's probably two to four weeks before the next phase begins. In the meantime, we will still continue to have our services in the format that we're having right now. And uh, when things change, we'll certainly let you know right away. Of course, I want to welcome those that don't normally come to our services, uh, who, are, who have joined us this morning. Welcome to our service. And of course, we do invite you, if you're in the area, to drop by Jones Lake Baptist Church here on uh, Upton and uh, West Mount Boulevard, right on the corner there. Anyway. Let us turn to uh, number 207, Only a Sinner, Saved by Grace, Only a Sinner. And we'll sing all four verses of this one. Not have I gotten but what I received, grace had bestowed it since I have believed. take your Bibles this morning, and I had Pastor Foley read out of John chapter 20 there. John chapter 20. <clears throat> and let's just uh, turn there 
And I want to focus your attention on uh, verse uh, 30. We won't read down through the passage again, uh, other than to say we know that this, uh, we're continuing to look at the events following uh, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples and Mary and some of the other folks that were there had gone to the tomb. And of course, as they go into the tomb, they find, or they get to the tomb, they find that it is open. And they enter in to find that the body of the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer inside. And it should not have come as a surprise to them, but they are. They are surprised, they're alarmed, they think that uh, somebody has stolen the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course the, uh, the uh, Pharisees and the scribes of the day tried to spread word that the disciples had actually come and taken the body to discredit the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then Jesus, over the next number of days before uh, the day of Pentecost, will appear unto various individuals. And he will make himself known, and he will uh, you know, make an appearance to show that, yeah, the tomb was empty, not because somebody had taken him out of there, but because Jesus had rose again. And he would very soon ascend up into heaven, take his rightful place, at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And so as we consider this passage, I just want to uh, talk about the purpose behind, the, you know, the reason why the Lord Jesus Christ did not go up to heaven right away. He could have completed the work and ascended into heaven and taken his place, but just as uh, we see throughout the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he has purpose in all that he does. And so, of course, this period of time, following the, the empty tomb, Jesus has a purpose in that. Let us uh, look at those uh, last couple of service, uh, verses there in uh, John chapter 20. It says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. You know, John makes it clear that you know, this is the, the purpose of the writing of the word of God, the writing of his, uh, uh, his gospel uh, specifically, is that people may know that, yeah, the ministry that Jesus undertook throughout his uh, time on the earth, especially that last three and a half years, was so that people might know God, and they might know the Lord Jesus Christ, and they might know the way of salvation. And so, of course, uh, he makes it clear that there was great purpose in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we consider our passage here this morning, the three things that I want to share with you as we consider the purpose of the resurrection, the purpose of Jesus appearing unto his disciples in this interlude before he'll ascend into heaven. And the first one is this, is uh, the first purpose is that Jesus would confirm the truth of the scriptures. As we uh, think of the ministry and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the uh, disciples, who of course would become uh, his apostles, those that were closest to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, they spent roughly three, three and a half years with him, being taught directly by him. And what a wonderful opportunity that would be to be taught by the Master, by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And of course, he would uh, not only uh, teach them by sitting them down and instructing them uh, on the different aspects of the scriptures of, the, of the, his Heavenly Father and of his ministry, but he would also uh, show them by experience and show them through the miracles that he performed. And yet, through it all, there was still some doubt in the hearts of the disciples. When Jesus uh, goes to the cross of Calvary, they, they cannot believe what has just happened. And they're even afterwards, they're... They're concerned, they're perplexed by all the events. We've talked about it before, a little bit about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus as Jesus approaches them. Uh, they're upset, they're concerned, and they were anticipating that Jesus would come and set up the kingdom. So they had not fully understood 
the scriptures and the things that Jesus had taught them. They hadn't really under, fully understood even the Old Testament scriptures. But uh, look at uh, Psalm number 16, if you will. Psalm number 16. And there should have been no surprise, just as, as Jesus says to those two disciples, he said, if you had a known the scriptures, you would have known that it was my lot to go to the cross of Calvary to suffer and pay for the sins of the whole world. He told that to um, Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him by night and uh, Jesus says, thou art a master of the scriptures, thou hast studied the scriptures, you should have known about me. But in Psalm number 16, we have a Psalm of David here, and it says here, uh, uh, verse number 10, Psalm 16, he says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And of course, David here is uh, praying to his heavenly Father and revealing that, referring to Jesus Christ here, that Jesus would not stay in the grave. And of course, there are many other verses that we could turn to, uh, to see the prophecies of how Jesus would come, he would die, and then he would uh, come back to life again and would fulfill the requirement for the payment of sin. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Of course, in Acts chapter 2, we'll read uh, Peter's message here. In verse 22 of Acts chapter 2, actually, you start in verse 14, it says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken of, uh, spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what a challenge Peter gives. Now this is... On the day of Pentecost, the fire has come down, and uh, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit has come down through a very visible form of fire, and uh, came down upon all those that were gathered there. And so Peter's using this opportunity to explain the events here. He says in verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. So they were certainly familiar with uh, the events and ministry of Jesus Christ. And it says, Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that should, he should be holden of it. The grave was not going to keep the Lord Jesus Christ permanently in the ground. It says in verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And so Peter refers back to that psalm that we read, uh, Psalm number 16, uh, of the fact that David had uh, understood 
the scriptures to know that Jesus would rise again. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and the sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Peter explains that psalm for these individuals. And it explains it for us today, that according to the Old Testament, Jesus would rise again. This should not have been a shock to the disciples. And yet Jesus appears unto them to confirm the truth of the scriptures. And in verse 32, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. It was this Jesus Christ who had just gone through the events that many of these individuals had witnessed, and, and had gone there and found the grave empty. It was that Jesus Christ that the scriptures had foretold that they would eventually find the grave empty. Jesus Christ himself tried to teach the disciples they knew not the scriptures. Oh, they were familiar with them, would have heard about them. But uh, still, they didn't understand it when Jesus went to the cross. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. Jesus speaking to his disciples and to specifically here in verse 38 of chapter 12 says, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. You know, they uh, constantly were testing and challenging the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, trying to get him to basically prove his authenticity. And uh, they were begging of a sign from him. Show us. And Jesus had already shown, uh, had done enough to show that he was the Messiah. But nevertheless... They plead for a sign. And in verse 39 it says, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall be no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And, of course, Jesus, referring back to the events um, in the book of Jonah, where Jonah was cast out of the ship into the sea and, of course, swallowed by a whale. Obviously, Jesus confirms in his own uh, speaking here to the Pharisees that he believed the events of uh, the Old Testament to be true. And not only to be true, but to be a very important sign to, especially the, the unsaved individuals here, of the very thing that Jesus would come to do. That he would be put in the grave, and three days later, he would come out of that grave. And so Jesus is confirming the truth of the scriptures to his disciples and to all those that were there. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and starting on verse 12, on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees, and went forth to meet him, and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples, 
at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, that they had done these things unto him. And even in the book of John here, John uh, comments the fact that really they did not understand at the time Jesus was teaching them, but his appearance unto them after the resurrection, and then of course as they stand there uh, towards the end of that time, before the day of Pentecost, they would stand there and they would watch Jesus being taken up into heaven. And that would remind them of the things that they had learned, remind them of the scriptures of even of the Old Testament, and would confirm for them that Jesus had fulfilled what had been proclaimed before. His appearance unto the disciples was to confirm the truth of the scriptures. Number two, it was also there to cast out doubt. First, I want to say this, though, is, you know, we, we don't have the Lord Jesus Christ uh, visibly and physically in our presence today. We have, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ in the world and dwelling in the heart of born-again believers through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But we don't have the luxury that the disciples had of seeing the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. But yet we have the account given to us in the scriptures, both the prophecy and the fulfillment of it in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we can believe what is said here. And that's why we can put our faith in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, is because we, we have the accounts, we know these things had happened just as they had been prophesied before. Confirmation of the truth. So number two was not only to confirm the truth of the scriptures, scriptures to the disciples, but it was also to cast out doubt. Let's turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And in the... And in John chapter 20, I'd like for you to turn to verse number 24. It says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So just before this, in John chapter 20, we have the disciples in the upper room. And, of course, Jesus appears unto them. They're, they're up there. They're locked in the upper room. And Jesus appears unto them without even opening the door. And then it's uh, a number of days later... When Jesus comes back uh, to them, but uh, uh, Thomas wasn't present that first time. And so the disciples are excited. They want to tell Thomas, look what happened. We've seen the Lord. We know that he's alive. And it says here, but Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hand the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, he says, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. You know, how often are we like uh, Thomas? You know, we want to believe. We, we, we have the account. We read it. We We've heard preaching on the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he accomplished, and yet, because we weren't there to see it for ourselves, because we weren't there to touch the Lord Jesus Christ, we still have doubt in our hearts. No, the Word of God is there to confirm for us and to cast away any doubt. Here's Thomas, here's, you know, just like any one of us, in the same situation, after all things have happened, saying, well, I don't really believe you, fellas, unless I see it for myself. And look what happens in verse 27. It says, Then saith he to Thomas. Now Jesus wasn't there physically when Thomas had said that, said that he doubted them. And he even said, Unless I'm able to touch his wounds, not just uh, you know, visibly see the Lord Jesus Christ, but unless I have the opportunity to actually examine the wounds to see that, yeah, this person is the same one that had been nailed to the cross. He says, I'm not going to believe. And notice Jesus zeroes right in and knows the conversation that Thomas had with them. He says, then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. 
And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. And, you know, it's wonderful that Thomas had that opportunity to have his faith confirmed by the fact that Jesus appeared unto them and was able to show evidence that he was the resurrected Lord. But notice he says here, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You know, that's, that's what faith is all about. Faith is not believing because we have all this concrete evidence that we're able to touch and see for ourselves. But faith is taking God's word and acting upon it. And God's word tells us that Jesus came. He ministered. He, he died and went to the cross of Calvary and took the sins of the whole world upon himself, even though he was not guilty, that we might have eternal life. And then he rose again. We do have the accounts. We can't go back and see it for ourselves because it was over 2,000 or roughly 2,000 years ago when this took place. But faith is believing even though we haven't seen these events for ourselves. You know, we're fortunate enough to have them written down for us. But blessed are they, as he says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe that the events that took place in the scriptures are so, even though we can't go back and see it for ourselves? Oh, how wonderful it would be if we could travel back in time and have the opportunity to watch some of the miracles and to hear Jesus teach and preach and to even get the chance to ask him questions. But we know that's not possible. But what a wonderful thing faith is then, even though we can't see him for ourselves, yet we believe what Jesus accomplished, that we might have eternal life. Jesus came and appeared unto the disciples to confirm to them the truth of the scriptures. And he came to cast out doubt as well. You now Jesus wanted them to go forth and to minister and teach and preach the gospel themselves with confidence and with assurance knowing that these things have been fulfilled. And we can today believe in the Word of God because it has been fulfilled and because we have the evidence at least written down for us. He came, he appeared unto them to cast out all doubt. And then, number three, he came and appeared unto them to give directions to them. It's amazing that after all the events and after all Jesus did to prepare them for the work that he wanted them to continue on. I mean, he had them he had them not only listening to him, but he had them working alongside him as well during his uh, life in ministry. And of course, he was he was training them up so that they would continue his work afterwards to to preach the gospel, to plant churches and to see uh, true Christianity grow and individuals come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet shortly after, and we, we kind of understand it, we know that ourselves, you go through uh, uh, circumstances like this, there would be some hurt, there'd be some confusion, there would be some grief and, and trying to sort it all out. But they go up to the upper room and sort of uh, hide themselves off from the community. And then shortly after Jesus appeared unto them here, we see, and, and last week we focused on this, uh, chapter 21, where it says, uh, verse 1, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. And verse 3, it says, Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. And they say unto him, We also go with thee. And they went forth and entered into a ship immediately that night, and they caught nothing. You know, they had, after they finally uh, got past the, the time of confusion and, and the grief, and then kind of settled into a routine, then we finally see the disciples basically return back to that which was uh, known and comfortable for them. And they go back, of course, to, to their fishing. But that's not what Jesus' plan was for them. And of course, he shows them in the events that would follow here, in verse 4, when he says, 
but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said unto them, Children, have ye any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the other side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it from the multitude of fishes. And, you know, how amazing it was for them to be able to uh, be out there all night toiling in, uh, uh, in fishing, trying to catch some fish, and not finding anything at all. And then when Jesus comes along the seashore and tells them to cast on the other side, they catch so many fish that they almost break their nets. Jesus has come to them, has appeared unto them to give them direction, to give them motivation. He wants them to begin to go and do the work that he had trained them up to do. Look at Matthew chapter 4. And Jesus makes that clear right from the beginning of his ministry. In Matthew chapter 4, as he is calling each one of the different disciples out, he meets them along the wayside. Of course, Jesus knows who they are and knows them. And he calls each one of them. Um, and if you look at Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. We talked about this last week, the parallels here. Uh, for they were fishers, and he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Jesus didn't want them to go back to their same old way of life, their same old way of doing things. No, Jesus was, had spent his time training them up to go and take the gospel, to reach the hearts of people who were in need of hearing about a Savior, hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it was God's will, it was the will of the Lord Jesus Christ that they would continue on the work that Jesus had begun in them. And so he, he appeared unto them to, to give them that direction and also to show them not only to get them to do the work and to go and declare the gospel, but also to show them that they need to do it God's way. No, God had a plan for them. Jesus set the example for them. And that's what they were to follow. Not only follow Jesus in his physical footsteps, but to learn from him, to watch as he preached the gospel, to watch as he did the work amongst the people so that they would follow him and do it God's way. Oh, there are many ways of um, ways of reaching people today or uh, various forms of Christianity that really do not line up with the scriptures. And yet, God wanted the disciples to go and be preachers of the gospel, to be fishers of men, to, to bring uh, people unto the Lord Jesus Christ and unto God and bring them into God's family. But of course, God had a way that he wanted them to do it simply by preaching the gospel message. That's why we continue to do that today. It's not complicated. It's, there, there is no magic formula. There is no um, uh, theatrics or anything like that that we need to use to convince people of their need to trust Jesus Christ their Savior. Jesus had a, a simple plan to go and proclaim the gospel message, to proclaim the truth of the scriptures. And so as born-again believers, we need to follow that same direction. God wants us to continue to the work, not only uh, like individuals like myself as pastors, but God wants us to continue the work personally as well by reaching out and by, uh, you know, the Bible says, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So we fulfill God's plan to reach others by living out the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives by being obedient unto him. And of course, he also said the greatest commandment is that we would love God with every part of our being. And of course, the second part of that is that we would love others as we love ourselves. You know, we're to 
love others by first and foremost loving God loving the Lord Jesus Christ living out the Word of God in our lives and then of course loving others by sharing the Word of God to them you know God appeared unto them to give direction direction for the disciples to go and do the work which of course we will see that work in the the remainder of the New Testament but it's also direction for us as well direction for you and for me who have put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to go and live it out in our lives to be that witness and testimony to draw people unto him and of course to share the gospel to tell people that there is hope to tell people that there is uh, life after death and it's found in the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified so I trust, you know, as we consider John and the events that followed, uh, the events, of course, of the crucifixion, and that those days before Jesus ascended in heaven, they were very important days. Those final days that Jesus would have to declare unto his disciples, to declare unto all those that were present that these things are true. What we find in the scriptures are true, can be trusted, and that our faith can be put in them. Our faith can be put in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that, you know, the, the resurrection, the, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ would fill our hearts with a desire to be faithful to God, to be a witness and a testimony for him. Father, we thank you for our time this morning. And once again, for your word and for the events that took place almost 2,000 years ago of the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, how wonderful it is to know that we have a Savior, that he set uh, not only the example, but of course he, he declared the way in order that we might have eternal life. So Lord, help us to live that out in our lives. Help us to be that witness and testimony for you. And Father, maybe there's someone this morning that's uh, curious about what it means to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, but they've never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, in the resurrected Savior. Maybe today, Lord, you'll work in their hearts and draw them unto you, and that they would seek out someone who knows the way to be saved, and that they might get saved themselves. Lord, I pray now that as we um, spend our day, that, Lord, we will focus on you, and not just today, but in the days ahead, and that we might also live before you, that our lives may glorify and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. <clears throat> you take our hymn books one more time. We will turn to number 308. I surrender all. And if we want to be a living testimony of our faith in Christ, is we need to live it out in our lives. And that is surrendering our will to God's will. So let's uh, sing verses 1, 2, and 4. All to Jesus I surrender. Surrender. 
I trust our message and our service today has been a blessing to each and every one of you. Join us again tonight at 6 p.m. as we will be back here live streaming for our evening service. Have yourself a good day and God bless.